Welcome. My name is Dr. Reinhard Krauss, and I would like to welcome you to this first in a series of three webinars on religion and democracy. The webinars are a collaborative project by Islami City, who is providing the video and the live streaming, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and the Academy for Judaic, Christian, and Islamic Studies, where I serve as the executive director. Let me make a quick note about the format for our, our webinar today. We will have three presenters who will each provide a brief 10 minute introduction to the topic from their respective religious tradition. This will be followed by a conversation by the three panelists and the three responders as well as questions from the audience. The event is being live streamed on YouTube, so you can enter your questions uh, in the comments on YouTube. The midterm elections are less than a month away. If you're following the news even casually, it's quite clear that things are not well with this country. We have moved far beyond the usual partisan rhetoric before every election. Democracy itself is being questioned and under serious threat as a shared, as a shared foundational value of this nation. In this perilous moment, we decided that it would be important to raise our voices and articulate why democracy matters for people of faith, not just to one particular faith tradition, but to people from a broad spectrum of religious perspectives. In this first conversation today, we will talk about how religion has contributed to the birth of modern democracy. We are keenly aware that the historical record is quite mixed. We do not intend to whitewash religion and claim that our respective religious traditions have always wholeheartedly supported democracy. That is clearly not the case. But we do contend that each of our traditions has been an important tributary to what eventually became the mighty stream we call modern democracy. Our first presenter today will be Dr. Yavad Hashmi. Dr. Hashmi is a board certified emergency physician and a former fellow of medical ethics at Harvard Medical School. In our planning meeting, Dr. Hashmi told us that despite his love for medicine, his first love has always been religious studies. So he decided to follow that passion in a serious way by pursuing a PhD at Harvard. Dr. Hashmi also serves as the newly appointed research director at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Dr. Hashmi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Krauss. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm gonna to share my screen. Hopefully that goes mm, okay. I'm sometimes technologically inept. Let's see how this goes. Can you see my PowerPoint okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Uh, just one second. Actually, I'm going to hide this and try one more time. All right. <clears throat> so I entitled my talk, uh, The Lock-In Moment in Islam, Muslims and Liberal Democratic Values. I am a little bit verbose, so if I could get a two-minute warning, that would be great, and I'll just have to cut myself off. Uh, before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, there is a dark side of liberalism, and I'm going to be talking about John Locke, and there's definitely a dark side to John Locke's legacy, um, including his involvement in settler, settler colonialism and slavery. Um, the more I study these topics, the more I am convinced that these are less aberrations that can be remedied with more liberalism, as perhaps some liberals would say, uh, but more that it's baked into the very logic of liberalism. Um, However, I am not an anti-liberal. I now consider myself a post-liberal, uh, where I, whereby I recognize the limitations and dangers of liberalism, but I also consider certain liberal values to be essential, including the ideas of basic human equality, freedom of religion, and the distribution or separation of powers, all 
liberal democratic values that are essential to us today. I'm going to start with a quote now. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We've all heard this quote, but I would contend that uh, despite this quote, it's really not self-evident. Uh, it at least hasn't been self-evident for thousands of years in all three of our religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As historian Samuel Moyne says, Christianity had mostly stood for values in inimical to these uh, throughout its history, and I would include the other faith traditions in this. Um, now, at the same time, though, maybe some secular atheists would be very excited at that news, but on the flip side, it is also um, undeniable that modern human rights, um, especially the idea of um, basic human equality, does have fundamentally religious roots, and that includes uh, from Christianity. Um, now, the people who would make that claim most strongly would, would want to kind of gloss over all of the dark sides of their own tradition and all the lumps, as Dr. Krauss mentioned, but that's not what we want to do here today. What I would argue instead is that uh, what we all do is we invent tradition. Um, Christian human rights were, and th these are uh, these are great quotes by uh, uh, Professor Moyne. Christian human rights were injected into tradition by pretending they were all they have always been there, and by taking the you know minor antecedents in history and treating them with a great deal of focus, highlighting those, and then you kind of gloss over issue you know things that run contrary to what you're espousing. But this is how traditions are always continuously formed and reformed. Um, and uh, the way to do that, again, is to play down or pass over the fact that Christianity had mostly stood for values inimical. Now, that may be too strong a claim, I would say. But the point is that uh, traditions are mixed, as Dr. Krauss said. And so we are always constructing and reconstructing our religious traditions using what we see as the best elements, elements of the past and passing over those parts that no longer seem appropriate. And perhaps at the ideal, we could recognize the, the flaws and the, and the errors and, and serve to correct those. Now, the other point I want to make is that I don't think theological reflection or reconstruction happens in a vacuum. Instead, it's under stress and when there's an advantage to do so that religious thinkers will rethink things. It's not really a, you know, a disinterested, disinterested philosopher sitting in an armchair somewhere just thinking things, but usually there's always something at stake. And if you look at human rights, there was the fear of totalitarianism and communism, which made many Christians embrace freedom of religion, for example. And this is from Samuel Moyne's book, uh, Christian Human Rights. Um, so you see that the Catholic Church went from opposing uh, freedom of religion as something heretical and something that would bring on secular atheism to actually being a shield from secular atheism. So I, I bring up all of this because we need to keep this in mind when we talk about the case of Islam. Uh, I would say, obviously, Islam is the case that's on everybody's mind nowadays because of, well, the situation is extremely bad and most of the Muslim, much of the Muslim world is not very friendly right now to uh, these liberal democratic values that we're speaking about. Now, the Islamic world is under severe stress due to colonialism and continued post-colonial domination by Western powers. That in itself is what spurs many Muslim thinkers to rethink and rearticulate uh, ideas. And I think that's not always a bad thing. Now, is there an advantage to freedom of religion? Yes, many Muslims do feel in Western or non-Muslim majority countries, there is an advantage to this idea, but not the case in a Muslim majority world. In this sense, it's not different than this, the Christians who did not see the benefit of it when they were the majority and ruled the state, but they did see it when they were fearful of secular atheists dominating. So, and that's what we could see this uh, dichotomy when you look at India and Pakistan, which border each other, Muslims in India support those tenets of secularism, whereas in Pakistan, they don't. It's not hard to guess why. However, nonetheless, I should say that we should nonetheless, even though we, we know that we are all in some way influenced by our positioning, that doesn't mean that our beliefs are insincere or anything of the sort. Um, so what we're doing is we're reconstructing the arc of Islamic history. Uh, and we're doing, we have, what I'm arguing here is that we do have lots of material to work from. A positive narrative for the liberal democratic values that we're talking about could be exemplified by two books. One by uh, Reza Shah Qazmi. This is my favorite. This is the spirit of tolerance um, in Islam. And the second one is the Islamic roots of democratic pluralism by uh, Dr. Sachidina. Now we should balance this with um, the other kind of, perspective. For example, Johannan Friedman's Tolerance and Coercion Islam, that shows maybe the dark side that many Muslims would want to gloss over. But I think it's by kind of looking at both of these um, that we can really get a, 
a balanced view about how to go forward, which is the constructive case of the positive narrative, but then also working to fix you know, where we think we may have erred in the past. So when I say that we have a lot to work from, uh, it has most historians do agree that the situation in the medieval Islamic world, as far as minorities, was relatively better than it was in the Christian West. Uh, this is not very controversial. This is a good quote by a rabbi in the fifth century. I'm not going to read it, but basically he's just saying, hey, it's it's pretty good in the Ottoman Empire compared to uh, the West, uh, the Christian West, Europe. And really the West is a modern construct. So I'm being a little ahistorical by using that term. Um, oh, that should say the edict of uh, Torda in 1568. Um, so we see that uh, there was this edict of religious tolerance that was issued. It was inspired by uh, a certain level of tolerance that existed in the Ottoman world. And this was because according to the Islamic tradition, a non-Muslims would pay a jizya, which was a tax that was definitely discriminatory. But once they paid that tax, they were given a wide berth of freedom as far as their religious beliefs were concerned. Now, there were some uh, uh, sometimes uh, enforced, but usually unenforced discriminatory rules as well. Again, there are those lumps and bumps in history that we can't deny. But for the most part, um, the Islamic world actually favored uh, positively compared to the uh, medieval Christendom, which is obviously the flip of the situation now in the modern world. We see that the Islamic world is definitely uh, the case of religious minorities is far, far worse and actually quite grim today. Um, but as uh, the historian Normal Daniel says, the notion of tolerance in Christendom was borrowed from Muslim practice. Now, whether or not that's a, you know, too strongly worded, I would say that there was a stream of thought that comes from uh, the Islamic world and the Ottomans in specific. Not only the Ottomans, we can't forget India or South Asia, where my ancestry is from. Uh, this is a, a text from, this was a ju uh, juridical text in which the Islamic jurist is actually saying, we, the Islamic jurists, are commanded to allow them, the non-Muslims, freedom in matters covered by their own laws. So we see that there was this idea of toleration of religious difference. Now we're coming to John Locke. Even John Locke, and that's kind of the linkage I'm making here, is he actually noted in his famous A Letter Concerning Toleration, and again, John Locke is the father of liberalism, um, and this text is considered kind of the most important when it comes to religious toleration. He actually noticed the contrast between the Ottomans and uh, Christian Europe, and he actually noticed how absurd it was that many Christian sects were uh, more free to practice their faith in the Islamic world than in parts of the Christian world. Now, uh, I'm, I'm actually in the, my actual project is to look at the work of John Locke. Um, many uh, scholars would say and thinkers would say that uh, John Locke's, uh, well, many people don't know this actually. John Locke was not the secular philosopher. Instead, he was deeply rooted in, in the Christian tradition and his Christian beliefs. Um, but I don't, but, but I'm hesitant when people say that, um, that he becomes unintelligible when he goes outside of the Christian West. Actually, what I think is, uh, he's drawing on this a reservoir of beliefs that are shared across Abrahamic traditions, and that therefore John Locke would actually be more intelligible to Muslims today if we actually talked about the religious roots of his arguments as opposed to secularizing John Locke. And that's kind of my intervention here. Also, it should be kept in mind that John Locke was no like orthodox or conservative Christian. He was uh, either a Unitarian or a Socinian. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, you know he denied the divinity of Christ, the Trinity. He denied original sin. So really, he was a Muslim. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, he was a, a rationalist believer, and so I think his views would actually um, be appealing to rational believers across traditions. I'm going to skip because um, I'm running out of time. But basically, his idea uh, in ten minutes was a very small amount of time. But basically, his ideas are rooted in a, um, in the idea of basic human equality, which itself is based in a religious premise that we are all the workmanship of God, um, and we are His property and that the idea that we were created in his image, these are deeply religious ideas, and it's not easy to secularize Locke. Um, every man has an immortal soul and capable of happiness or misery, and based on this, Locke argued that we would get divine punishment in the next life, and that means that in this life, other human beings should not judge us for our religious beliefs, and that opens up a space for religious toleration. Um, he believes that God is the one who created free will, even though philosophically he says it's hard to defend free will. And then he said, if God wanted to convert everybody, he could do it by his divine armies. Um, so why would human beings do it if God didn't do it himself? I got a lot of quotes. I apologize, but I, I, I will share this afterward. Um, and then he said, 
belief and faith is all about inner conviction in the mind. And so the only tool that you can use is persuasion and not force. Um, so all you can use is exhortations, admonitions, and advices. He was opposed to orthodoxy because he thought orthodoxy was at the point of the sword by the uh, state. Um, and he argued that love and charity uh, is the way forward, not force. And this opened up a space for religious toleration. But this idea of love and charity was rooted in this Christian ethic. Um, so the bottom line is, uh, well, let me skip these. I'm basically just saying that the original articulation of Lockean toleration in my opinion, which is religious, will appeal to and inspire many Muslims over the secularized version that is often presented. Um, and then just real quick, I just need one more minute or two more minutes at most. Um, I wanted to show you some quotes from the Quran, which sound very Lockean. It's the same Lockean logic. And this is the kind of uh, text that many Muslims will use to rearticulate um, their tradition. So, oh, so here we see that God is the one who created all of mankind from a single soul. So we have this shared humanity and we're all equal before God, except for in our deeds, whether whoever is more righteous is higher in the sight of God, but otherwise we are equal before God. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clearly from error. That part is very Lockean. Here again, we have the Lockean argument that God himself could have compelled everyone to believe. So would you then compel men until they become believers? So Muhammad and his followers are told them to just be reminders. They are not warders over them. They can't force them to believe. Whoever wants to believe, let him believe. And whosoever will, let him disbelieve. Unto you, your religion, and unto me, my religion. And it's even part of God's divine providence that he will that we all be different religious communities and that we race with each other in uh, good deeds. And the decision is not for you, O Muhammad, whether he, God turns in mercy to them or punishes them. Again, this is the Lockean argument that we, we wait for the next life for judgment. And until then, we pardon and forbear. So I have some more quotes, but I'm running out of time. So I'll end it there. Thank you. Well, this is really quite extraordinary. Thank you for the smorgasbord of ideas. You have lots of food for thought, and we could um, have a conversation. I wanted, I can't wait for uh, your PhD thesis to be published and for us to read it in context and longer than uh, 10 minutes. So a big, a big thank you uh, to you. Thank you. And thank you. I'm particularly impressed um, that as you started, you said, um, we believe in these truths to be self-evident. They are not quite self-evident without a religious rooting. They're really religious truths, um, and that is being glossed over by secular liberalism, liberalism, as you say. So a big thank you. Food for thought. We will have a lively conversation. Um, let us uh, let me introduce uh, Reverend uh, Jonathan Shute. He is also a graduate from Harvard, and since 1998, he has served as the senior pastor of Rolling Hills United Methodist Church in Rolling Hills Estates. In our many years of friendship, I've always appreciated his rare combination of being able to weave together deep spiritual insights with solid historical scholarship. So the floor is yours, Reverend Shute. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhardt. I'll uh, start. Um, the, the contributions of the United Methodist Church uh, to this conversation um, are, are not um, profound, uh, deeply historically grounded or, or uh, universal in, in uh, an aspect. So I'm gonna just a brief note on that and then I'm going to look to other resources in uh, the, the broader Protestant tradition and I'll try not to misrepresent uh, anybody too, too egregiously. Um, the United Methodist Church today is the second largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Um, it is a, a tiny fraction uh, of, of uh, American uh, Christians that thought to be about 65 million Roman Catholics, perhaps 22 to 25 million Southern Baptists, about uh, 8 million United Methodists. So uh, we look about to be less united than we were. Um, uh, likely having uh, some splintering over uh, welcome and inclusion of our LGBTQIA family. Um, so that's who we are in the United States. But a hundred years ago, 
150 years ago, um, it would almost have been true to say that to be an American Christian was likely to make you a Methodist. Um, the, the Roman Catholic uh, 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 growth had not taken place uh, in the mid 1800s that, that came a little bit later that century. Um, and uh, there were Congregationalist Presbyterians and, and some uh, emerging Lutherans, but um, the, the Methodists had grown out of the Church of England and were uniquely created out of the American War of Independence. The Church of England withdrew its priests from the now United States. We had clearly, uh, by throwing off uh, the rule of the King of England, had clearly become an apostate nation. Um, they didn't want their uh, clergy serving in such uh, untoward circumstances and uh, really much against his better judgment. Uh, John Wesley, who was the founder of the what was then a really a reform movement within the Church of England, um, uh, ended up uh, authorizing some of his key leaders from England to come and gather with uh, some of the remaining leaders then in the new United States uh, to form a denomination. So it, it really, uh, it, it was uh, sort of co coexistent with the, the birth of the nation. Um, and uh, as the United States grew uh, and, and uh, uh, covered more territory. Much of that growth included uh, United Methodists. So we were once predominant. We are now no longer predominant. Um, good practice for uh, the, the coming days, I think. Um, I wanted to touch on two characters um, who are not a part of the direct United Methodist tradition and briefly on both of them um, without the, the detail that we've, that we've just heard and the level of of uh, uh, scholarship behind that, but to, to draw lines between a couple of uh, earlier uh, Christian figures and the uh, quote that uh, was the, the opening um, from the Declaration of Independence, uh, that, that uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. And the person that I would first want to touch on is, um, perhaps surprisingly, uh, Martin Luther, um, who um, in the early 16th century um, was in a struggle with a church that was his own. It was not, there was no Lutheran church. He was an, intended to be a faithful uh, member of the church, um, but who was in a struggle over the issue of uh, grace and forgiveness and how it was mediated and the church held that it was mediated through uh, clergy, through bishops, through um, archbishops, through the Pope and through a uh, very hierarchical religious structure um, that, that required a level of accommodation and compliance um, by believers in order to, uh, to receive this uh, uh, manifestation of God's uh, mercy, God's grace. And the, that came most to a head with the selling of what were called indulgences, um, uh, essentially um, theological brownie points that could benefit you or someone dear to you um, and shorten their time in purgatory um, by uh, acts of contrition, acts of uh, generosity, and particularly generosity around the building of the um, Basilica in Rome, um, St. Peter's. Um, the, the selling of those uh, brownie points uh, was uh, something that bothered Luther, whose feeling was that um, God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness is a free gift. How is it that we could um, be uh, selling something, charging for something that has actually already been given. And uh, sort of out of that came his formulation that uh, grace was uh, equally available to all. It did not need to be mediated in a hierarchical structure, but was uh, immediately and intimately available to uh, each and every believer. And, and th there are some who would say that you can draw a line from that expression uh, of, of grace being equally available to all 
that that uh, from there to uh, that that all are created equal. Um, that was um, not something Luther had in mind. Um, I don't want to say that. I don't want to make Luther into uh, a Lockean liberal Democrat. That would not be who he was. Um, there were, uh, I think, if you want to talk about bumps in the road, that he had more than bumps. Um, his uh, virulent anti-Semitism, uh, his intolerance of people who uh, were persuaded by his original insight and, and thought they could add to it, um, uh, he, he objected to uh, stridently. So I, I'm not going to try to make Martin Luther um, a co-author of the Declaration of Independence. Um, but the, the next character that I wanted to touch on uh, is Roger Williams who uh, came to Massachusetts uh, after uh, working with um, uh, uh, some of the legal and philosophical um, uh, leaders in England in the uh, early uh, 17th century, um, uh, Thomas uh, Cook especially, um, uh, came to Massachusetts with the intention of being a Puritan minister. Uh, that's who he was. He was he arrived in I think 1630, so about 10 years after the the first pilgrims uh, arrived in, in Massachusetts, um, and uh, was offered a position at uh, the leading church in Boston and turned it down because he found the faithlessness of that congregation uh, more than he could handle. Um, he went through uh, numerous struggles uh, in different communities there in Massachusetts. Um, was back and forth between Massachusetts and England a couple of times, um, looking to establish uh, a, 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 a place where uh, persons could uh, practice their faith um, without uh, compulsion from uh, the, the uh, civil authorities. And, and he framed that particularly in terms of the two tables of the uh, Ten Commandments suggesting that uh, civil authorities had every right and reason to uh, exercise uh, care and concern with people around those commandments that dealt with our uh, human community. Um, stealing, cheating, adultery, murder, those, those were appropriately governmental concerns, but that the state had no authority, none, to uh, express uh, any uh, compulsion around the, the first tablet. That is, what do people believe that that needed to remain between them and God? Now, again, Roger Williams was not um, a, 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 a co-author of the Declaration of Independence, but he, he achieved a remarkable thing, which was a charter for what became uh, Rhode Island uh, that was signed by uh, King Charles II saying two things. One, that the form of government of this new chartered realm would be democratical. This was a, a, a king, a monarch, uh, one who had benefited from or understood to be participant in the divine right of kings, uh, authorizing uh, a, a, a different form of uh, civil authority based on the consent of the governed. Um, and the other was that, that Rhode Island was the first place uh, in, in, certainly in the Western Christian tradition to be established in which uh, freedom of religion was uh, an inherent and a central part of the identity of the founding of the place. Um, that actually carried over, still under Charles II, to a couple of uh, other colonies. I want to say South Carolina, um, perhaps Georgia, I don't remember, um, who had built into their charters, again, freedom of conscience on matters of religion. And this was in the mid-1600s, um, and a remarkable accomplishment, uh, especially considering who it was um, that, that did so. Uh, and uh, the expression about separation of church and state or the wall between church and state is actually an expression that does go back to Roger Williams, who said that there needed to be a wall between the garden of faith and the uh, worldly uh, realm, which he, he called the wilderness. Um, 
that, that there were uh, certain civil authorities that had appropriate um, uh, rights and rules over the one realm, but had no say over the other. That was uh, up to uh, a person's conscience and their community. Um, so um, again, uh, not that there aren't bumps in the road and I really appreciated the, the, the insight that um, uh, we have learned and borrowed and stolen and uh, evolved and re-evolved uh, and continue to reinterpret our traditions, uh, remembering the things that we cherish and uh, sometimes overlooking uh, the, the less uh, encouraging parts of our stories. And with that, I will um, yield the floor and hope that I have not gone over. Well, thank you very much for uh, another very nuanced uh, look at the Christian tradition, not pasting over the, the dark sides, but also uh, look, looking and highlighting uh, things that we can draw on in this day when democracy is being threatened. And to say, yes, it was also religious motivation and intention that were, was a tributary to this uh, stream we now call democracy. Now to the religious tradition with which it all started, Judaism, the mother of Christianity and Islam, so to speak. Dr. Scott Spitzer is a political scientist with a PhD from Columbia University, and he teaches at Cal State Fullerton and perhaps particularly relevant to this conversation, he is the director of the CSU Fullerton Town Hall Meeting Program. Uh, so the floor is yours, Dr. Spitzel. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, what really fascinating, I feel like I want to change all my comments because of your my colleagues' uh, presentations about Locke and about um, individualism. Uh, but I'm going to actually, you know, first of all, I'm really humbled to be asked. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this really important, timely uh, series of panels. Um, I'm I'm really not a, an ideal representative of the Jewish people. I'm I'm also I'm I'm not a Jewish studies professor. I'm not a, a Bible scholar, and I'm not a rabbi. Um, however, while I don't play a rabbi on TV, I am married to one, <laughs> uh, Rabbi Marsha Tilchin, who's uh, the founder and director of the Jewish Collaborative of Orange County, and also a president, uh, the president of the Orange County Interfaith Network. And I'm I I certainly. Uh, see myself as a partner to her and in, in the and that uh in her important work and uh, as Reinhard said I you know I'm a professor of political science at Cal State Fullerton and my research focuses on American politics specifically on ways that post-war presidents have handled racial politics within the context of social welfare policy making so pretty far afield from this but this topic is is particularly important, I believe, uh, given the widespread feeling that democracy in the United States and abroad is under a grave threat from spreading authoritarian populism that seems to consider democracy an impediment to progress rather than uh, a key to it. Usually when we speak of religion and politics, we focus on either in political science, we either focus on the political behavior of different religious groups voting patterns, ideological tendencies, policy positions, or as my colleagues have been talking about on uh, religious freedom to some extent, they've been talking about that. But this question is different that I, I wanna take up. What do our religions seem to say about democracy itself? And what does Judaism say in particular? And I wanna concentrate on three uh, things. One, uh, Judaism's embrace of uh, uh, genuine equality. Uh, secondly, the recognition that a Republican form of government centered on representation is necessary for a well-functioning society. And third, a history uh, of Jewish American connections to democracy, all in the space of seven and a half minutes. Um, first, the embrace of equality. Um, there are no kings in Judaism. Um, I think my, my colleagues would recognize this in the same uh, in the same way. There's no kings except for God. 
All other rulers are subservient to God. Moreover, every Jew uh, is considered to be part of a community of priests. The Torah reads in Exodus 19.6 that God made all of Israel a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, what does that actually really mean? One of our great scholars, Rashi, says that this is meant metaphorically, that all of us are given Torah, revelation, that each of us is to build upon this. But the thing I'm noticing here is that this is this radical notion of equality. The actual temple priests are more servants, maybe even functionaries, the Kohanim, the late Levites. They're holy for sure, but not morally superior to anybody else and certainly not more important. Where else do we see this kind of concept of equality? And the idea that as early as 400 AD, learning was to be A, the key to who would be our leaders. The most learned among us were to be recognized as the ones who would make the decisions for the community and the rest of us would follow. Hence, rabbi, our leader, is teacher. Literally, that's the translation. And indeed, everyone learned. Even the orphan, even the poor uh, was invited to and and had to be learned, right? Uh, A third, uh, very early on, a third part, so that's a kind of uh, different kind of equality. And the third part, that performing mitzvot or good deeds uh, was required of all Jews and that those who are truly righteous in this way were to be elevated. Therefore, it wasn't wealth or status, you know, that, that conferred status. Uh, or b- being born to the right parents. It was being learned. It was being righteous. Now, of course, uh, I asked my 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 wife, uh, spouse, Rabbi Tilchin, I said, well, you know, did everyone learn? Or did, you know, if you were wealthy, or did you get to learn from the better teachers? She said, well, everyone learned with each other. And yes, of course, there were connections and networks, but um, there was always this kind of more openness to people rising up from below to the, the top based on their, their gray matter, their ability to think. And now there's another p- thing that I wanted to talk about, which is in the, the same part of the Torah that talks about that God made Israelites a kingdom of priests. Um, this is a section of the Torah known as Yitro named after Moses' father-in-law. We also learn that Moses is not going to be able to perform all of the judging and advising, all of the governing of the nation of Israel, 600,000 people who left uh, Egypt by himself. Um, And then Yitro gives him advice that you should be setting up, uh, uh, you should appoint other people, other leaders who will appoint other leaders below them, and to divide up uh, access to the leadership so that everybody has somebody connect in their in their local network that they can come to for uh, an adjudication of a conflict or something of that sort. And and what I take out of this is the is that there's a sense that the people need to be governed and the pu- and the public need to have some ex- access in this it's a kind of a sense of 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 uh of a uh representation or a republican form of government um maybe that's a little bit of a stretch but that's kind of how i see this beginning sense of 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 de- uh, democratic representation um they weren't elected that's the <laughs> that is the missing link here of course um now there's another aspect that i want to focus on which is that Jewish experience in America. The First Amendment's separation of church and state, which uh, you guys were talking about earlier, and which was originally intended actually to protect Protestantism, really, was, and and the you know Roger Williams. I, I you know I note that um, the oldest synagogue in the United States, and there's a there's an argument whether it's in Charleston or in Newport Beach, but um, in Newport, Rhode Island, um, but. Most people think it's the Turo Synagogue in Newport, and I don't think it's an accidental uh, that 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 is in a place where Roger Williams set up this, you know, first separation of church and state, this idea. But this has been incredibly helpful to the small minority of Jews. We're only 2.4% of the United States today. 
um, much smaller in the beginning of the country. Um, but we were able to practice Judaism in the United States fairly freely. Now, of course, that's not to whitewash, you know, terrible anti-Semitism in American history, uh, but in a formal way, our nation's constitution recognized religious freedom, and that was critical for Jews. Jews used their freedoms after big waves of immigration in the 1890s to the 1920s, and then again after World War II, when millions of Jews came to the United States from Eastern and Western Europe, my grandparents came to the United States in, uh, during World War I, and Jews came to the United States and they, they embraced their new nation as their safe haven. Uh, my grandfather wanted nothing more than to be American. A generation of Yiddish-speaking immigrants gave birth to children who wanted nothing more to the, than to speak English and to be fully American. Jews embraced this freedom and wanted to, uh, to perform it in a way by protecting others from persecution. They were at the forefront of the labor movement from the early part of the 20th century through to today. And they're among the first whites in the United States to embrace the movement for desegregation and the broader fights for civil rights. And, and, and more generally speaking, Jews became just deeply connected to uh, American democratic process. Uh, Jews vote at higher rates than almost any other uh, uh, group um, in America, regardless of class or education. Um, there are Jews involved in the leadership of both the Democratic and the Republican parties. Um, although since the New Deal, nearly 70% of American Jews have voted for Democrats in, Repu in, in presidential elections. And that's every presidential election since 32. Um, 1932. And while Israel's this, of course, a very important issue to American Jews, Jews ba vote based on all sorts of issues and concerns, including core concerns for fighting any kind of persecution and oppression. That last piece, this interest in fighting oppression, persecution, obviously there's a lot of self-interest. Jewish history is replete with um, you know, horrible levels of uh, violence in Europe and in other parts of the world, um, expulsions, exiles, and not to mention the in, uh, unspeakable horrors of the Holocaust in uh, at, during during World War II. Um, but there's also a Jewish value set apart from that experience, which dovetails nicely with it. Um, that concern for the, our own well-being and persecution, but this other idea that the world is broken and that it is up to us in partnership with God to repair it for all people. It, this is the, the concept in Judaism that you might have heard of called tikkun olam or repair the world. Um, and so finally, it's this sense of commonality that uh, Jews to Jews, Jews to other minorities, Jews to the nation as a whole that provided their safe haven, and Jews to the world of humanity as a fundamental value within Judaism that defines much of how Jewish people understand their lives, not only as individuals that are seeking to be good or holy or to participate in tikkun olam, but as part of multiple communities, their local synagogue, their broader local Jewish community, their adopted homeland, uh, which has provided uh, more of a safe haven to the Jews than in any other time in history uh, for, all, for, for all of Jewish his, history. Indeed, this is my final point, that Judaism is much more than a religion. It's, it's a culture, it's a people, it's all three at once. And our history has not been easy. Um, uh, but America, the premier democracy, uh, took Jews in, not without complications, I, I know, but Jewish life in America has really truly been the best that Jews have ever experienced anywhere in the world at any time in our history. Um, we have thrived because of that First Amendment promise of religious freedom. Uh, we've thrived because the country has embraced immigrants at different periods of time. It's also rejected immigrants, um, of course. Um, but it, it's in this promise of democracy that protects Jews uh, you know, uh, that that we see a lot of valuation within the Jewish community for democracy. Authoritarian regimes 
tend to be really dangerous for Jews. Democracy then is found in our religious values and it's embraced here in the United States by Jews and in other countries uh, uh, that are democracies because of its openness to minorities, because of its opportunities for Jews to really participate. It's part of our religious values, our culture and history as a people. Um, so uh, there's lots more to say about this. Of course, uh, I'll, I'll just want, I'll, I, I can't really do this talk without mentioning Israel at all, because I think it's really important. Israel is a very new experience for Jews. For thousands of years, there's been no national autonomy uh, for Jews. And clearly in Israel, there are many, many challenges uh, in the exercise of democracy, that once we've had power and we've had our own country, um, right, not the least of which has been, you know, arising from the extended occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, um, but also from uh, how Israel handles uh, internal political conflict, um, right? This next month, we're going to have another election in Israel. It's the fifth election that we've had in Israel in the last two years. So democracy is really imperfect in practice. And I think that I would like sort of open that up to the, the group later, which is the, there are all these lovely values that are embedded in my religion um, and which I really believe in, uh, but then in practice, right? Trying to actually enact those principles in the case of, governing in Israel, for example, um, it's a lot more challenging and a lot more uh, complicated. So I'll stop right there. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Spitzer. We have really seen a smorgasbord of very nuanced uh, presentations from, from each of you. And I have to say, as a political scientist, you have sat at the feet of your rabbi spouse and know quite a lot about uh, uh, religious studies. So thank you for that. Um, and in the remaining time that we have, I would like to give our youth responders the opportunity to comment on what we have heard. And to mix things up, let's reverse the historical order of the three religious traditions and start with Judaism. Um, Yael Aronoff is a rabbinical student at American Jewish University. She just returned from a year in Israel. Uh, she's also the co-president of the Academy for Judaic, Christian and Islamic Studies. What are your thoughts, Yael? The floor is yours. So first of all, just thank you all so much for those really informative presentations. I found it really interesting that you all did touch on the notion of separation of church and state and religious freedom. Um, and the phrase uh, separation of church and state always interests me because it allows both for a few reasons, but one is that it allows both freedom of religion and freedom from religion. So I would love um, in a few moments, whether um, any of you wanna touch on any more in terms of how each of the faith traditions interacts with this notion. And also specifically, since we're here to it, one of the things we want to explore here is why people of faith have a vital stake in the survival and flourishing of democracy. I'm wondering how uh, this religious freedom impacts the modern American iterations of each of our faith traditions. And also, are we feeling that with all the current events we've been going through, are we as a nation still dedicated to this and um, are there ways we can rededicate ourselves to this? So those are a lot of questions, but since it was touched on in each presentation, if you want to take any one of those, um, I would be interested to hear more on that. Well, thank you, Yael. These are indeed a lot of questions, and we would need a couple of hours to <laughs> talk about that. My, my question is whether the presenters want to pick one and maybe respond to one of the questions perhaps that Yael raised in about two minutes or less? Yeah, uh, Dr. Spitzer. Well, I, I, I do wanna talk a little bit about sort of the contemporary challenges and I'll just, and this will be less than two minutes, which is I feel that the, the First Amendment, is the line of separation between church and state, right? Which is Thomas Jefferson's statement, it's not written in the First Amendment, but, uh, the question is how high should that uh, wall, how how high should the wall be between church and state, right? 
And I think it's been lowered and lowered and lowered, and we're getting a blurring of lines in that there's this sense that uh, you often will hear people talk uh, on the right in the United States about how the United States is a Christian nation, uh, which I believe is threatening to Christians, um, as well as, uh, of course, Jews and Muslims and non-religious people. Um, so uh, I, I'm worried about that, and I believe that it's uh, it's 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 hard to educate people about the importance of, as a religious person, to talk about how important religion is. And that's why we don't want it in the, that's why we want a separation of church and state, right? It sounds like I don't think it's important. At least that's what the the critique of that uh, liberal idea is, is that how can you not have the values of religion in the public square? Um, and so, you know, I think that's a really, really powerfully important issue in today's politics. Thank you. Uh, one of our other panelists want to chime in? I'll try to do so just briefly. I, I think that freedom of religion must include freedom from religion. And it was uh, among, among others, uh, Baptists, I think in Maryland who were, uh, you know, had, had experienced what it was to be oppressed by a state religion in Europe and who wanted to make sure that they had the freedom to exercise their consciences in the, the newly formed uh, nation. There were state churches at individual states, those mostly went away by the 1820s, 1840s, but there was there was no sense of compulsion around uh, faith and belief. And, and I think that that has to include uh, people who see no faith community or tradition that they participate in, or, or it doesn't really hold for anyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Hashmi, you... Yes, I mean, I absolutely agree with uh, the panelists um, that uh, freedom from religion is also must be included in freedom of religion. And uh, as Locke put it, as the Quran puts it as well, um, you can't compel you can't compel people's inner convictions. And so I think uh, we best realize that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's. Uh move to Emily Nortus. She is a doctoral student in archaeology at UCLA. And in addition to her scholarly research, she is particularly interested in exploring how ancient religions can be related to modern day religious, religious beliefs and practices uh, of today. So Emily. I also wanted to just start by saying uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, this was a lot of super interesting and uh, thought provoking presentations. One thing I really appreciated was how um, each presentation sort of talked about and acknowledged um, the ways that particular historical contexts have impacted um, the ways their religious tradi traditions has sort of thought about um, democracy, uh, religious freedom, and the like. Um, and as we're sort of in this particular um, context and moment, um, we've all sort of touched on ways that um, different uh, religions are now sort of um, reacting um, in some negative ways. Um, I was wondering if you all would be willing to sort of touch on um, some um, perhaps more positive ways in this context you've seen um, sort of different uh, reinterpretations or reconstructions of um, particular religious thoughts or ways that we could. So um, if I hear you right, Emily, are you asking what religions can contribute positively in the current climate? Yeah, that's what it boils down to. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, I don't wanna make assignments, just go ahead and you leave your leave your mics open. Well, I'll just jump in really quick, which, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. And I do think, you know, as, as we've evolved as, as in, in secular world, right? Things have changed. 
And in particular, I think about the issue of gender. Um, all of our religions, certainly Judaism was a very patriarchal religion in, in the practice of it, right? From uh, women were not leaders in the synagogue. But of course, since you know the uh, feminist movement, first and second wave, things have changed quite a bit. Um, it's it's complicated. I'm not going to be an, I'm not an expert on feminism at all, but but I will say that you know uh, contemporary Judaism, particularly the con, the conservative Judaism and Reform Judaism, more so Reform, a little bit less so for conservative Judaism, have recognized the equality of women as leaders as well as um, uh, participants in the synagogue, and I think that's been a really important shift. Um, even some sects of orthodoxy have started to incorporate women leaders, women rabbis um, in, in different ways as well. And so I think that's a big change. And I know that um, this is not just an issue uh, on gender, it's also in terms of LGBTQ plus issues. Um, and I know uh, these are all challenges for the my for all of these religions we're talking about today. Um. Well, thank you. Uh, Yael uh, shared with us as the co-president in our uh, of the academy in our planning meetings that she had some experiences when she was in Israel uh, with with regard to this very issue of the rights of women. And from what you said, Yael, it seemed to be um, coming from your faith conviction. So I wonder whether you want to just share a little with us. In, sorry, in terms of? In terms of your experiences of pushing for the rights of women to be equally recognized uh, in the public sphere and the religious sphere. Sure, um, and I do think it's it's uh, connects to um, uh, our at least from the conservative Jewish perspective and my understanding of it, it connects to how we understand the evolving, the evolution of Jewish law, and being able to apply uh, a, a Jewish legal process to uh, modern uh, needs. And so that's what uh, uh, we were uh, um, touching on. That there's like slight differences in reform and conservative. That it took a little while longer for conservative to get to the point um, of uh, allowing women to become rabbis and the like. And in Israel, also where there is another sort of climate there, also a religious democracy, so different situation. But um, wanting to, there are a lot of uh, communities in Israel that are pushing um, for awesome. this kind of gender equality in uh, in the leadership of religious spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, and you did some uh, wonderful little revolutionary acts while, while being there in pursuit of that. So that was uh, wonderful to hear. Thank you. Um, I wanna, uh, I think we're gonna go a little over because um, the conversation is so wonderfully varied and multifaceted. I believe Dr. Hashmi uh, has to leave us fairly soon because he has a flight to catch and I wanna thank him already. Um, but I wanna invite Kinan Tawil, who is the program coordinator for Muslim Student Life at Loyola Marymount University. And Kinan actually is the one who first suggested these conversations on religion and democracy. So now that you have and are witnessing the first installment, what are your thoughts and comments, Kinan? Thank you, Reinhardt, and thank you to all the panelists for these very interesting uh, presentations. I also really appreciated the historical perspective, the uh, uh, global perspective as well. Um, I have a lot of questions I could ask, but I, I'll try to put them all together and, and open it up to all the panelists. Um, I'm thinking about all the different challenges, you know, in addition to the threats to democracy, but, you know, faith traditions are also facing other challenges. There's growing secularism, you know, there's the question of um, the relevance of faith traditions today in the world. Um, and there's also, you know, those within the faith traditions, as we discussed and alluded to, who, um, 
don't see that the faith tradition should defend democracy. Um, so I wonder, you know, how can uh, faith traditions respond to these challenges and still be a strong, effective, relevant voice in the fight for democracy uh, today as they were in the past in history? So if you don't mind if I uh, answer that, because then I'm going to go run for my flight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, an amazing conversation. Um, I don't think that there's any special answer to that other than what Locke said, which is we can only use the force of persuasion, good argumentation. And we do need to recognize that true tolerance, true toleration, I think means at some level even acknowledging the right of others to disagree with you, um, even when it is deemed to be very illiberal or even odious to us. Um, and so I think it requires that um, level of tolerance. And I think that's difficult because human nature is such that we want to enforce our beliefs on others no matter what. And I think this is across the board, whether you're a religious person, whether you're a liberal person, and that's really the dark side of uh, liberalism that I was speaking about that um, in order to liberate the individual, the state has to get more and more intrusive and all powerful. And uh, in order to enforce those values abroad, you have to you have a military uh, that backs you up. And so th these are certain dangers that I think we should be aware of. And so I think the only alternative is uh, to use good argumentation um, and it'll take time. You can only win by uh, hearts and minds and um, also, keeping an open mind that maybe there's something you can learn from your interlocutor as well. So uh, yeah. thank you so much and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for those, um, this insight. What I also hear in Kinan's question is, is there a need for not, not just for the religious voice to be heard in the marketplace, but is there also a need for intra-religious conversation namely do we need to talk and argue and seek to be persuasive to our sisters and brothers in our same camp who don't believe that democracy is worth preserving so that's what i also hear in in kinan's question right uh, some, sometimes that's a harder conversation Sometimes the interfaith conversation is one in which we bring charity and an and open mind and heart. And because we, we may not suspect that, they're, that we're drawing exactly from the same well, we're happily surprised when we discover points of contact and shared uh, imagination and, and we're delighted. Uh, meanwhile, the, the people down the pew or down the row uh, from us um, who have been with us, you know, for 15 years singing out of the same hymnal, we find out that they hold something that to us is deeply abhorrent and it, 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 it completely um, uh, demoralizes us. We think, how could, how could this possibly be? And, and so I, I do think those conversations are vital within our own communities and um, that that if we if we can't have uh, healthy and, and hopeful conversations there, um, the notion that we're going to be able to uh, heal the world if we can't even heal our own uh, row and worship on a weekend uh, is a little daunting. So, but the question is, how do you go about that? How do you how do you? I mean, are there in our deeply fractured, polarized society? Are there ways to talk with co-religionists or people uh, across the across the fence, your neighbor? What what are what are skills that we need for that? It, it just quickly as a as a preacher, it is to preach uh, subversively and sneakily um, to 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 use stories that are true and to lift up threads out of the fabric of the, the text and the tradition that, that may have been overlooked. Uh, and, um, you know, in a way within scriptural study and, and American Christendom, there's, you know, there's a similar uh, tension 
between fundamentalism and uh, a, a broader, more liberal treatment of the text, not dissimilar from uh, the way uh, members of uh, American judiciary are uh, originalists or uh, living constitutionalists. Uh, and I'm out of the tradition that says that the text is alive and the, the spirit of God is alive and at work in and through us and our engagement with the text. There may be new things to learn um, for our setting that, that need to happen. And, and uh, so I, I do seek to um, uh, tweak and uh, pull out of the text things that people might not have noticed when, they, when, when they're uh, reading it along and think that this is a familiar story and they're nodding their heads. I wanna find something that, that they hadn't seen before and say, look, look what's here. Um, and and yeah. leave it, to, leave it to, to God to do some of the work. Because they consider the text itself authoritative in your, and then to say, this is actually what the, what the text says. Yes. Are there other, um, other techniques or hopeful signs that any of you have said in talking with people who disagree and who say, maybe democracy is not worth saving that come from your religious convictions, uh, Dr. Spitzer? Well, I don't know anybody who says democracy is not worth saving. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't get a chance to share the space with people who like that. But um, I will say this, uh, one of the things that I, I'm struck by, um, I forget your name, uh, Emily, is it Emily? Yeah, your comment is that, you know, when we think about the, uh, the, the polarization in our country, partisan polarization, one facet of that is that it seems that uh, according to polling, people who are more religious, who go to synagogue more, church more, mosque more, are much more likely to be Republican, to identify as Republican than Democrat, and that people who are completely secular uh, atheists are much more likely to identify as a Democrat. So as uh, but so there's an opportunity for people of faith who are Democrats, right? Or people to build, to have a, have a dialogue across those differences. And likewise, within our faith, to find people who, uh, right, who share religious commonalities, but might differ politically. Um, I, I, there have been a number of times when I've met some great people doing um, charity work, like work for helping the homeless. Um, and I'm serving meals and things like that. And I find out uh, that the person next to me who I feel is a wonderful, you know, like, look, we're, we're doing this good work together. And I find out they're probably a Trump supporter. I don't know that. I, don't, I stop that, conver I stop going in that direction in the conversation. I go away from it. But I'm kind of struck by like how much of our worldviews and our values are similar. And yet our political views are completely diametrically opposite. And, um, and I think that says to me personally that there's an opportunity there for someone way more skillful than me to, do, to, to create ways to get people with different political views diametrically opposed political views to talk about the ways that some of their core values are similar. Um, and, and maybe religion holds one, one com uh, component of that. And this, this harkens back to what Dr. Hashmi pointed out that it's really the marketplace of ideas. And this is what democracy is built on that everyone has a voice. And my feeling is that one aspect that we haven't touched on today is that all our religions teach humility. And that includes intellectual humility, namely the notion that we can learn from other people who have different ideas and different opinions. So it's a democratic value, but it also is a deeply religious value. And uh, so maybe the best way to do that is to simply practice and to say, how do you come to the view that you have rather than simply immediately seeking to find uh, counter arguments? Uh, so that's a religious value for, uh, I think, all three religious traditions, but it's also 
a foundational value of democracy that uh, to be open to be convinced of another perspective if somebody presents uh, better arguments. Um, I have a feeling we could uh, talk for at least another couple of hours, uh, but our time is also uh, over and I want to honor uh, our audience who has made a commitment to be with us for an hour. I wanna sincerely thank you for a very enlightening, nuanced and uh, broad conversation and I would uh, like to thank you and also invite our audience to tune in next week uh, at six o'clock, not at five o'clock. It will be an hour later. And we will talk about the alternative of uh, democracy as uh, a government organized and whose authority is based on the will of the people versus a theocracy where some people think they have uh, the will of God understood and want to enforce it on everybody else. So uh, that will be another conversation that we are all looking forward to. And I wanna thank you all and uh, a good evening to everybody who is listening.